optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just seeing a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by ConvertKit, my go-to email service provider. I use them for everything. If you've ever wondered how professional bloggers, podcasters, YouTubers, and so on can build a platform they control and get the word out about their best content, email is still the answer. People think it's all social, 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 but one algorithm change and oops, bait and switch, now you only reach 10% of your audience. That is why I've doubled and tripled down on email. After reviewing many different email service providers, I ended up selecting ConvertKit for email like Five Bullet Friday, which goes out to about a million people now because ConvertKit delivers on what matters most, to me at least. Easy to use systems, split testing and resending technology, both very, very important, high rates of deliverability and great hands-on customer service. So whether you run a business or simply have, say, a serious blog, ConvertKit has integrations with more than 70 different services, just about anything you might need, including hosting sites like WordPress, e-commerce platforms like Shopify, lead capture technology like Bounce Exchange or Sumo, and many more. They also offer a visual automation builder that makes it really easy to deliver the right content to the right people in your audience just when they want it, if you want to segment in different ways, which a lot of people do. ConvertKit offers plans that adjust to the size of your business, so it's a good option whether you have 1,000 people or 1 million on your list. And certainly, I am planning on growing and growing and growing, and I don't like switching email service providers, so I thought very carefully about this before I selected them. So check it out. Take a look at convertkit.com forward slash Tim. That's convert, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-K-I-T.com forward slash Tim. And you can get your first month for free to kick the tires, test it out. That way, you can give it a shot, make sure that it works for you, your business, and all of that goodness. If you're like me, I hope you'll find that they get the job done. That's certainly been my experience. So check it out. Again, that's convertkit.com forward slash Tim for a free month of email services. This episode is brought to you by WordPress.com. I love WordPress. I have used it for so many years. It's my go-to platform for blogging and creating websites. I use WordPress.com for everything, every day. My site, Tim.blog, is built on it. The websites for my books, including Tools of Titans, Tribe of Mentors, it's all on WordPress.com. And the founder, Matt Mullenweg, one of my close friends, has appeared on this show many times. Just search Matt Mullenweg Tequila Ferris for quite an exciting time. Whether you're looking to create a personal blog, a business site, or both, you can make a really big impact right out of the box when you build on WordPress.com. And you'll be in good company. It's used by The New Yorker, Jay-Z, Beyonce, 538, TechCrunch, TED, CNN, and Time, just to name a handful. And one of my friends at Google, who shall remain nameless, has told me that WordPress.com offers the, quote, best out-of-the-box SEO imaginable, end quote. And it's one of the many reasons that nearly 30% of the internet is run on WordPress. You do not need experience or to hire someone. That's perhaps the best part. WordPress.com guides you through the entire experience. They have hundreds of designs and templates that you can use. And it's easy to get started. There's no need to worry about security, upgrades, hosting, any of that. They offer 24-7 support. And they're very, very responsive. If you have questions, they get right back to you. And this allows you to create the highest quality with the least amount of headache and friction. So if you're building a website, period, when my friends come to me and ask what I use, what I recommend they use, the answer is WordPress.com. So check it out. If you want to get started today, learn more with a 15% discount off any new plan. Go to WordPress.com forward slash Tim to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. So learn more. Take a look. WordPress.com forward slash Tim for 15% off a brand new website. Check it out. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show and my brand new podcast, Tribe of Mentors, because this guest is suitable for both. Mike Maples, he's one of my favorite people, one of my oldest mentors, not in biological age, but he goes back probably 15, 20 years teaching me. And he is the man who effectively taught me how to invest. And the audio you're going to hear 
was recorded in front of a sold-out audience at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. It was a blast. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And it takes us a few minutes to warm up, and then we get into not only investing, but also his life philosophies, parenting. He is such a splendid human being and has a very, very wide set of skills. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mike Maples. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. This is going to be great. And uh, I'll read some suggested introductory remarks first. Thank you all for coming tonight. Welcome to tonight's program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. And what I'm not going to do is sit here and regurgitate stuff that is already in the book that you just bought, because that's very boring. So what I thought I would do instead is invite one of my friends who is in this book to join me on stage and to dig into some of the old stories, the stuff you guys haven't heard, and uh, to really just banter, because he is one of my favorite people. So, who is this favorite person? (laughs) Kevin Rose is one of my favorite people, but he has a brand new human being to take care of, so he is not here to booze it up with Ferris, I'm very sad to say. Mike Maples Jr. You can find him on Twitter, at M2JR, floodgate.com. Mike Mables Jr. is a partner at Floodgate, a venture capital firm that specializes in micro-cap investments and startups. He's also the person responsible for introducing me to tech investing in general. And we go way, way back. He has been on the Forbes Midas list since 2010 and named one of Fortune Magazine's eight rising stars. Before becoming a full-time investor, this is very important, Mike was an operator. He was involved as a founder and operating executive at back-to-back startup IPOs, including Tivoli Systems, acquired by IBM, Motive, IPO Motive, acquired by Alcatel-Lucent. Some of Mike's investments include Twitter, Twitch.tv, NGMoco, Weebly, Chegg, Bizarre Voice, Spiceworks, Okta, Demandforce, and many, many, many others. Please help me. Welcome to the stage, Mike Maples. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I thought we were just having a little chat at like a bookstore or something. I guess uh, you tend to draw a crowd. I keep forgetting that. So, yeah. so I was trying to put us connecting on a timeline. And I think we've had a number of, of interactions beginning. It had to be back pre-2000, maybe? Yeah, I think, and, and I think that when we first started catching up, it was... Um, Right before you had done the four hour work week, and yeah. you were so um, Tim, Tim wasn't sure what to call this, but am I, I just anything goes? Anything okay. goes. Okay. I may regret so, that, uh, but yes. So, so Tim, and you know, I'm a little bit less over my skis sometimes than Tim is. Uh, well, it depends on the area, but whatever. So, um, but so Tim was deciding whether to call the book uh, The Four Hour Work Week or uh, Drug Dealing for Fun and Profit. And, um, <laughs> And I was like, Tim, why do you want to write a book about being a druggie? You know, this is just a terrible idea. You know, you'd be, it's just a terrible influence, just, just a bad idea. And Tim was like, well, you know, you really want to get people, you know, sort of to provoked, point of departure, right, to, to get access to the ideas. And so we did this thing, I think we called it ghetto testing, where um, we said, hey, look, let's not argue, let's not, in your opinion versus mine, let's just test the two titles, and just say, hey, buy the four-hour work week. Hey, buy drug dealing for fun and profit. And, you know, neither book exists yet, so people would click on it, and they'd get a 404 error. But we could, we could understand, like, what got the better response. Yeah. And so now it was no longer your opinion versus mine. It was just like, what do people respond to? Right. So, so yeah? we, we did this. That's my recollection. Yes, no, we had yeah. this testing, but it goes <laughs> even further back. So you had appeared. I was more of a spectator. Okay. In a class that I took in college. Oh, when you were like high tech entrepreneurship, back wow. when I had more hair on my head. And Mike came to talk about Thunder Lizards. Yes. Which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, that was part of what piqued my interest in Silicon Valley, the Bay Area, the excitement certainly of the time, 99, who, <laughs> I mean, granted, <laughs> that was an exciting time to be running towards the precipice also. Uh, but got me out here. And then our conversations around the time that the four-hour work week came out, 
uh, involved, to my recollection, many things, but we would sit at, and I might be getting this wrong, but Hobie's. Hobie's, yeah, in town and country. Town and which country. Which is unfortunately no longer with us. And they we would, have it on a Rastradero, but not on. And we used to just yeah. eat omelets and, uh, and talk about marketing and PR, but also about the deals that you were becoming involved with. Yeah. And the, the testing for people who don't know was very simple. I mean, we had a number of different titles and uh, used Google AdWords, which was, I mean, it was the golden age of Google AdWords. You could do, just shoot fish in a barrel. It was so inexpensive. And so we took the, the headlines, the perspective headlines, as the, as the actual ad headlines, and then the perspective subtitles as the ad text, and then had all these unique URLs that, like you said, went nowhere, because all we really cared about was the click-through rate. What I also did, if we want to talk about businesses going out of business, there are a lot of them to point to, is I went to Palo Alto, University Ave, to the borders that existed at the time, and to test covers, I had mock-ups that I printed out, and I would wrap a book that was roughly the same size I thought mine would be, put it up during what I perceived to be rush hour at Borders. Not sure how I figured that out. And I would s- stand there like a bouncer keeping track of fire code, like click, click, watching the number of people who picked it up like every 15 minutes. So I could try to look at the visual appeal of different covers. Now it's a lot easier. You don't have to quite do that. Skill is wine. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 I should, you know, yeah. maybe I need some booze up here. We'll get to that. Uh, but what I wanted to do. So, so can I just interject one other thing about these books? You should interject with so, many other things. So I went to Kepler's bookstore and Printer's Inc., I guess, right? Because they're, they're like well known as bellwether bookstores. And, uh, and I was like, I'm gonna, I went and bought $1,000 worth of his book, The Four Hour Work Week at both bookstores. And we didn't really know at the time, but Bellwether bookstores kind of trigger supply chains. And so it's a little bit like before the app store happened, right? Because the iPhone wasn't out yet. And so, so like I'd go into these bookstores and I'd be like, how many copies do you have in the bookstore? I want to buy them all because this book's going to be hot and I'm doing this offsite and I need every copy you've got because I doubt you have enough copies for all the people in this organization I've run. And so, which was just me at the time, <laughs> but, uh, but like what it turned out, it was true, right? It, like it becomes, oh, wow, Kepler's Bookstore and Printer's Inc., they're selling out like crazy this four-hour work week. And then it's just a hot heat seeker on the New York Times, and then more people read it, and it becomes up on the, it, it, obviously it was a good book, that helped. <laughs> but, uh, but it was like, it, just looking back on it, how, how crazy that was, because I just, like, maybe you thought it was going to be this huge uh, breakout bestseller. But I remember I was just like, hey, I'll read these drafts and, like, oh, I'll help early. however I can. And, like, I hope it works out. But, yeah, you know, was, whatever. Right? It was, <laughs> I think you offered one of the very first blurbs in the first edition of 4-Hour Workweek. After oh, you read okay. additional copies, I go, okay. Yeah, you're Maybe like, I, I made it up. I'm not sure. do a quote. <laughs> She's just like, okay, I'll do one. <laughs> but what, when we're talking about this alchemy, for instance... Kepler's, let's just say. So unbeknownst to me, there's certain stores that trigger certain other things, and there's this, I'm not going to say black magic, but there's this, uh, these tipping points. So now people look at what you've accomplished and the investments you've made and the Midas list and everything, and it's, oh, my God, Mike Maples, and sort of in, in quotation marks. But my understanding is that uh, you had a tough time uh, getting hired as a venture capitalist when you first yeah. got here. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? You know, it's like in uh, Coach Bill Campbell. How many people have heard of Coach Bill Campbell before? Uh, fair number. Uh, and for those of you who haven't, I'll just give the quick version. Bill was an early executive at Apple, and then he ran a company called Claris, and then Go, which flamed out, and then he was CEO of Intuit. But probably more significantly, he became kind of the most famous coach in Silicon Valley. He'd been a football coach before he was a business guy. And so he was on the board of Google and Apple, and uh, actually, I got a chance to work with him in Twitter and in uh, Demand Force, which were two companies he got involved with that we invested in. And um, uh, Bill's favorite song was You Can't Always Get What You Want by the Rolling Stones. And uh, it always struck me that, and, and I, we won't do too much of the book, but um, that, that sometimes you, you, the stuff you're not getting right now that you think you want wasn't the thing you really wanted. And so I couldn't get any venture firms to hire me coming to Silicon Valley. I was just this random guy who'd moved to Silicon Valley from Austin, Texas, never done an angel investment in my life. And, uh, you know, Kevin Rose, one of your favorite guys, one of my favorites too, um, 
the first two entrepreneurs I ever backed were Evan Williams, uh, who ended up doing Twitter, and then Kevin Rose. And uh, by the time I met Kevin, no venture firm would hire me. Nobody thought I knew consumer internet because I was an enterprise software guy. Nobody thought I knew how to invest. And I was like, Kevin, look, I just, um, I really need you to take my money on this thing. And I, you know, um, <laughs> that's what I'm we call afraid, a high leverage I'm opener. Afraid, I'm afraid that um, I'm going to have to go on hunger strike in your apartment if you don't <laughs> take my money in this dig deal. And, um, you know, he, he ended up letting, letting me, you know, uh, Kevin and then Jay Adelson let me invest in dig and, uh, you know, Dig had a kind of a circuitous path, but, um, you know, I look back on it, um, that was the sort of the booster rocket. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's funny, people talk about who backed them or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think it, that it, it was uh, Kevin's generosity that uh, sort, of, sort of got me going. Sorry. Get, no. I get caught up in this stuff. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so, uh, so you and I share a similar affection for the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin's a sweetheart of a yeah. guy. Yeah. Also one goofy motherfucker, as you guys know. Uh, I, well, you, you, know, you know more about that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I know more about, well, we won't get into that. But how did yeah. you yeah. connect with Kevin? I mean, how did that meeting end up happening? Well, it was, uh, Ron Conway was really generous, so, um, I heard about this guy named Ron Conway. I reached out to him. Who, I mean, probably still, but was thought of as the godfather. The fam- most famous angel and investor of the world, right? And so, so we go to the Oasis, and, and uh, or was it the Oasis? I can't, or maybe the Goose. And uh, I say, what hey, Ron. I say, hey, what? no, no, uh, a restaurant, a restaurant <laughs> oh, okay. in, in Palo Alto, in, a, in Menlo Park. No, I think it was the Goose. And, um, and, and so, so, uh, so Ron's like, hey, great to meet you. And I said, Ron, I just want one chance, just one chance to work with you on one thing. Just give me one chance. That's all I need. And he's like, okay, whatever. You get your chance. What, what does that mean? <laughs> and I said, well, there's this company that I'm interested in called Dig. And I had come up with my own independent conviction about it. But there's no way, like, how am I going to ever get in touch with Kevin Rose, right? I'm just some random dude. And so... Um, so Ron's like, he looks at his spreadsheet, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm meeting with him next week. You want to come with me to see Dig? And I'm like, sure, let's do it. And I just knew their, you know, I knew what they were trying to do. You know, I cared a lot about their mission, and, you know, I wasn't talking about things like cohort analysis or, you know, like what was the retention and the decay factor of the users. It was more like, you guys are transforming journalism, and this is like super important, and it's like the wisdom of the crowds applied to stories, and, and so like it was just, I think that part of why Kevin gave me a shot and Jay was that they just knew I just cared a lot about what they're doing for my own reasons. Well, I think that from, from the opposite side of the Hobie's brunch table, when I heard you talking about startups, you were always genuinely, personally vested and excited about the products. And you spent a lot of time not just looking at the deal structure and the this and the that and the particulars of whatever the projections might be, but the product yeah. itself. Yeah. And knowing Kevin as well as I do now, like I would see that as a key factor. I mean, also yeah. uh, many other things to him then gravitating to you in that way. And I, when I think back to our, our lunches, we would talk about all these various things. And I would pepper Mike with all these questions. Like, wait, what's, what's a clawback? What's a uh, pro rat? I don't know what that is. What's this? What's that? And eventually... Like any of it matters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all blindfolded monkeys throwing darts. But I really wanted to know how the best blindfolded monkeys threw the darts. So <laughs> we're digging into it. And I remember at the time, I was, I was pretty... Bef- this was before the four-hour work week popped. Because uh, keep in mind that that book had an init- initial print run of between ten and 12,000 copies. Right? I mean... Not even national distribution. No one expected it to do really much of anything. And I was eager to take a little vacation, and I thought this two-year vacation called an MBA might be interesting. So I was looking at Stanford Business School, and I made all these visits. And there were some great classes. One was taught by Pete Wendell, uh, Venture Capital, Inside the Trenches, really great class by an operator. But then there was all this theoretical stuff that I just couldn't quite stomach. 
And after, I don't know, four or five of these lunches, I said, wait a second, maybe I could put together a real world MBA and make this you know, Tim Ferriss fund in principle and spend 120 grand over two years and learn all these things and develop all these relationships and view the 120K as sunk cost. Like that's gone, it's tuition. But I don't know if you recall, but right off the bat, what do I do? So I asked Mike if he'd be willing to let me piggyback on, on a couple of deals to co-invest and be really uh, sort of cheap labor you know, like to try to over-deliver to these companies. And uh, I, <laughs> if you want to mention it, you can, but I'm not going to bring up the name of the company. But there was this company uh, that uh, you, you, you were very measured in, in assessing, and he told me about it, and it was super popular, I think, in Taiwan or somewhere. And I got so over-enthused. I was like, I want to put in 50K. Now, keep in mind, that's 50K of 60 for my first year. And in the first deal, I wanted to do 50K. And I remember what you said to me at the time in your very Mike way. You said, well, well, Tim, uh, don't you think that might be a little aggressive? And I was like, no, man, this is going to be the next Google. And then I just saw you sure like, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, uh, yeah, that didn't, that didn't, uh, that, that forced me, though, if you want to talk about, like, life saving you from what you want, um, losing, I mean, it, it wasn't immediately lost. That's part of the tricky one tricky aspect of the startup stuff is like you might not have a clean loss for many, many, many years. Yeah. Uh, you just might have but like... You, the, you solve that quickly. Yeah, so you might have yeah. a Walking Dead yeah. scenario where it's just like, it. I am legend, and you're like, oh, now what do I do? <laughs> <sighs> kind of like certain areas in SF past six o'clock. Anyway, so <laughs> I need more alcohol so I can excuse all the things that I'm going to say. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. So... The, the point was I had to then figure out something called advising because I was already out of money in year one. And that led to, in that period of time, a lot of the absolute best connections that I made, including just to, just to highlight something that comes up over and over again in Tribe of Mentors. It comes up over and over again in conversations with you. There are these catastrophes or business failures that really end up in no uncertain terms, sowing the seeds of really huge later success, right? Like you mentioned the circuitous path of dig, but who cares? Because you befriended and became an ally of Kevin Rose, who knows everyone yep. just about in tech and is very generous with making introductions. And if he cares about you and believes in you, he'll make those introductions. Similarly, I ended up at one point introduced to Garrett Camp, and I advised Stumble Upon. Stumble Upon didn't work out. Uh, but we had a, a chance to work together extensively. And then what did Garrett Camp go on to do? He started Excellent. this thing that people laughed at called Uber Cab LLC, which then got renamed and became Uber. Right? So that, at least on paper, has worked out very well. That's so more important than clawbacks. Yeah, more important than clawbacks. <laughs> uh, so first and foremost, thank you for uh, shepherding me, even as uh, a, you were a quick study, as seems. much of a blunt instrument as I was into all of that. But could you tell us about some of the responses from the venture capitalists? These rejections, like what happened? Can you tell us about a meet? You don't have to name names, well, but like, you know, well, how did these meetings I, go? I don't blame them. I mean, uh, I'd never made an angel investment before. I was from Austin, Texas. I had no network here. I just show up saying, "Hey, I think I want to be a VC." <laughs> And, um, you know, that's not, a, like that's a, not, that's not a, a very straightforward path. Um, and so, you know, I would call up Sequoia Capital and say, hey, I'd like to interview for a job at Sequoia Capital. And that's just not how it really works. And so, um, you know, I have no animus towards anybody. Like, they probably, um, you know, they probably made the right decision at the time for w what their parameters were. So you, you have a characteristic, it seems, at least in the way you express yourself, that I don't see in a lot of people, and that is you seem to hold very, very few grudges. I don't think I've ever heard you express ill will towards anyone, uh, especially in this day and age. That's a rarity. Is that something that you've always had by, by birth, or is that something you developed? Why is that? It's a waste of time. But how did you learn that? How did you embody it's, that? It is, because if you, uh, I, I don't know, I kind of I look at it like life is short, you don't have much time, every day is a gift, and the, the part of the secret of happiness is to figure out what your gift is and to offer it to the world and to like not worry about 
all the noise and the hype around you that says what you should do. You know, think for yourself and don't waste any ergs and energy on the stuff that doesn't matter to you. And holding a grudge is a symptom of not knowing how you want to spend the gift of today. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to hold a grudge. If you're, if you're so focused on, I'm excited about these things, I can do a good job at this, I can't wait to do this stuff, how do you have time for grudges? It's just, it just doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a few people, you know, but, you know, just to be honest, but, you know. <laughs> Yeah. When, so, so you land in Silicon Valley. Sequoia's like... And it good, wasn't just Sequoia. It's no, no, no. I don't, I'm not trying to shave, I probably shave their nuts for yeah. undue reason. I'm just saying... I'm singling them out because I was taking a fling at an impossible dream. Oh, and Sequoia's yeah. like, hey, Harvard, I want early acceptance to start, and I want to start in the middle of the year, even though yeah. I don't have the prereqs. I mean, yeah. in a sense, right? And it's, I have that, no resume, no grades. That's a hard pitch. Yeah. Uh, and they're really good at what they do. Yeah, but, it, but, it turns out it was, yeah. Yeah, but you, but you land here... You, you yeah. don't get the jobs. You are given this, this gift of an introduction through Ron with really smart wordsmithing. I hope you guys are listening. Like the pitch is really, really important and nuanced. You end up meeting Kevin Rose. So you, you invest in Evan. Now, at the time, was it Twitter or was it? It was Odeo. It was Podcast Odeo. Account. So walk us through how that unfolded. Well, um, I thought, you know, I was in Austin, and what I would do is, you know, my kids were in uh, grade school, and so we weren't sure whether to move yet, so I would come out every Sunday night and stay till Thursday. And it's funny, because when you're on that pattern on the plane, some of the same people are on the plane, like system integrator consultants, people from Deloitte and stuff, and I'd be like, oh, it's the brothers, you know, it's, hey, buds, what's, what's going on? But, uh, so I'd be on these plane flights with all these people. And we would, um, yeah. we would, uh, I'd, I'd go from Monday this, to Thursday. And this is always God, dangerous when that? I get the bottle. Liquid right. courage, yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, and so I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take nine months and figure out if I can find something exciting in Silicon Valley. So I just basically immigrated here. And the reason that I did that was that I thought the, the web was shifting from uh, uh, an internet of connected pages to a platform that would connect people. And it just felt like it was kind of time to get the party started again on the internet. You know, the bubble had burst, the, the, the meltdown had happened. And I saw things happen. I saw Tim O'Reilly talk about Web 2.0. I saw stuff about podcasting and broadcasting and stuff like that. And I was like, it's just clear to me, this is just obvious that something major new is happening. And I just have to go to California. I have to go right now, not wait another day. And so, so I'd do that, and, and Ev had the best podcasting company. And so I, you know, Jeff Huber at Google introduced me to him. He said, we just ran him off because he doesn't want to work at a big company, but he's going to do something interesting podcasting. And, and somehow Evan took my money his first time ever. So now he took your money, but, but walk us through. That, by the way, that's a pretty good start in investing. That's a fantastic start. Kevin Williams start. and then Kevin Rose. Yeah. It's not bad. You uh, know, you could argue that the secret to venture is to get lucky in your first five years. <laughs> which I think is a pretty strong argument. Oh, I think it's a huge argument. Yeah. Uh, but you, you've, you've since then been uh-huh. quite consistent. I should, now correct me if I'm wrong, but with Odeo, uh-huh. there was, a, was there a point when Ev, who was a very good guy, decided to offer investors the ability to, to get, yeah. get their money back? Yeah, so what happened was, um, so I invest in Odeo. I'm like, okay, great, best podcasting company. First angel investment I've ever made. Just wired the money in. A week later, Apple decides they're going to give away podcasting on iTunes. And at the time, it's hard to remember now, but 85% of all playback devices were iPods. So, like, what are we going to be? The, the, the one you pay for on the Zoom, right? Like, it's like, what business? Like, you, you don't have a business, There's right? still people trying like, that. No. And so, so, so uh, Ev, to his credit, tried for about a year to figure out another business, and um, we couldn't. And we'd go brainstorm, and we'd look at each other, and we're like, yeah, it's pretty tough. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so one day, some of the investors were getting pretty disenchanted because they're like, you're just wasting our money. You know, there's no business here. And so Ev decides to give it back to everybody. And so, uh, so I'm like, look, Ev, you know, you don't owe me anything. Venture capital is in the, the word adventure has venture in it. And you win some, you lose some, right? 
He goes, well, this is the kind of the deal I've struck with some of the bigger investors, and it'd be, it would help me a lot if you just went along with it. And so I said, well, as long as you let me invest in your next thing. And he goes, well, part of this deal is I get to keep this IP that I've been working on on the side, and we're trying to decide whether to call it Voicemail 2.0 or TWTTR. And it's one of J Jack is working on it along with Noah, and we're figuring this out. And I'm like, what is, I'm like, come on, voicemail 2.0, and like, why don't you put the vowels back in? Because like, Twitter without the vowels sounds like Flickr, and that's derivative and whatever. So I don't think I had anything to do with that, by the way, but like, it's just my gut reaction. So he goes, uh, you say what you're doing. And I'm like, well, then what, ha and, and, okay, yeah, then what happens? <laughs> and he goes, at 140 characters or less, because we wanted to do cell phones and stuff. And I'm like, I mean, this is before the iPhone, right? So, so I'm like, okay. And then what happens? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, that's it. That's all it does. <laughs> and I say, uh, uh, what's the roadmap? There is no roadmap. <laughs> and uh, what's the revenue model? There is no revenue model. <laughs> and so I say, um, Ev, uh, like, why do you even think this is a product, much less a business, a company? And he goes, oh, I have no idea if it is. But he goes, here's the way I'm thinking about it. Like, Blogger, a million people used Blogger software. And this is Ev's first company was Blogger. He was one of the pioneers of blogging. He goes, podcasting's kind of hard. You had to use Audio Studio. You had to record stuff. You had to put it on an RSS feed. He's like, it just took more effort. He's like, what happens if you had microblogs? And rather than a million people did microblogs, 10 million people did microblogs. He's like, I think if 10 million people did microblogs, the burden of proof will be on the people who are negative. And so I was like, sounds good to me. Uh, I'd like to invest in Twitter or voicemail 2.0, whatever you call this thing. And, uh, and he says, well, it's, you know, it's not a company. There is no investment. But, uh, and, then, and then a few months later, uh, maybe six months later, Twitter blows up at South By, which is such a delicious irony, right? Because it's from Austin, right? The town I just come from. And uh, a couple weeks later, Ev says, hey, and I thought by then, it's like a hot air balloon drifting away. There's no way I'm going to get to invest. You know, Ev's going to have forgotten and everybody's going to be chasing him. And he calls me up one day and says, hey, did you mean it when you said you wanted to invest in uh, Twitter? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, um, we're about to take our first money. And if you want to do that, now is the time. Wow. Yeah. Ev's a good guy. He is. So, like, I, I, I remember that because both of those guys were good to me. You know, yeah. like, I was just some random Joe Schmo guy. And uh, both of them, uh, you know, gave me a chance to be involved in their companies. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Good guys. And the... Our yeah, I, I, I try to remember that. Every time an entrepreneur pitches us, I, you know, I try to remember the grace those guys showed me. And our stories intertwine in so many ways because yeah. that I, I met him right around the time we were hanging out exactly. on this book. Yeah. And 2007, yeah. South by Southwest, I yeah. begged and pleaded with Hugh Forrest, who was running South by Interactive, or at least the programming side. Still is. Still is. Yeah. And uh, now a neighbor of mine, effectively. And I begged and pleaded. I said, if you have any last minute cans, I know you don't have any spots because I've already been rejected multiple times. But if you have a cancellation, if yeah. there's anything that moves and there's a spot, please let me know. I'd love the opportunity. And lo and behold, there was this chance, 2007, which at the time, to put it in perspective, Twitter, all of the tweets in the world <laughs> were being displayed on these big screen TVs that were positioned yeah. around the conference hall. Just one feed, moving kind of slowly, every Twitter user. I was briefly in the top 100. I was very proud of that until Ashton Kutcher came along and just like kicked my head right Killed off. You. Uh, and I do. I never cracked the top 100. <laughs> Don't answer. Well, you only, you only needed like 500 at one yeah. point, and then it was gone. But I should have been Mike at Twitter. But I was like, oh come on! Like, how well, far? There's is this so many go? people who have yeah. that story. They're yeah. like, oh, I just chose like Hawaii yeah. Steak 5.0 as my username because who? It's not going to become anything. And then again, like, yeah, now I'm stuck with that for the rest of my life. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I ended up getting an email from Hugh, and he's like, hey, if you meant it, like, we have an overflow room that had a cancellation, a sponsor yeah. isn't going to do their shtick, yeah. so if you want it, you have 45 so minutes. So you blew up at South by, too. I did, and uh, it was, and what was really funny about it uh, is I was so nervous, I was so nervous, it was my first presentation, really, about 
the book, and it was before the book came out. The book came out in April 2007. This was in March. And I was staying at a friend's place because I couldn't, I, did, I, I wasn't going to pay for the hotels. They're all sold out. Also, if you get a room, it's like $1,000 a night during South By. So I stayed in uh, my friend's house, and I would go into his garage, and I rehearsed my talk in front of his three chihuahuas. And I'll explain, <laughs> I'll explain why. A, my friend had other things to do, and he had a real job, so I, he wasn't going to be there. But the chihuahuas, you had to be at least like 10% Tony Robbins to keep them engaged. <laughs> And, and these dogs Is are, that your secret? No. Well, Is that your secret? If I could be 10% Tony Robbins, I'm doing pretty if well. If you were in Tribe of Mentors, would you, that would be your, like, talk like it's a I'd chihuahua? I'd say here's, yeah, my yeah. trick, my secret trick for networking <laughs> is first practice with dogs because they don't care about the content so much. But if you're monotone, they just kind of go, uh, and then turn around and walk away. So I was in the garage, and I'm, like, kind of doing this hand-wavy stuff to keep them engaged. This, I totally believe this. <laughs> oh, no, it, it yeah. happened. I remember the garage. And then I go to the event, and I had all these fancy slides and everything prepared. And what happens? Blue screen of death. My computer oh, dies. And so I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to have to do this without any of my prompts. And I did it, but I'd rehearsed so much that I had it in my head. And, uh, yeah, so Hugh, also one of those people. It's like to this day, if Hugh ever asks me, like, hey, could you help us with X, Y, and Z South by? It's like, of course. Of yeah. course. Of course I will, because and it's just like that one opportunity. And I also want to emphasize one thing. People could say, well, you know, the, the luck was there with Twitter at the same time. And it was absolutely lucky. But it's like every year there is something to draft on. Like every month there's something like that that you can draft on. You just have to look for it. But you're going to... But the other, well, the other thing is it's kind of, I guess, we talked about grudges earlier. To, to me, like the opposite of having a grudge is like to enjoy seeing somebody do well. Yeah. Right? And like, um, when I was a founder, you're just trying to do real company stuff and make the company happen. And you're like, okay, we're going to go on this ride and hopefully it works out. But one of the fun things about being an investor is you get to see people do well. You know, you get to see, you know, like Logan and John uh, from Lyft ate beans until they raised their seed round. And when we had our first board meeting, Ann looks at the financials and says, you guys aren't paying yourselves minimum wage. And that's illegal in California. Like, we have to fix that. <laughs> and so, so like, and now, now people talk about how much money Lyft has and how Carl Icahn's invested in Google Capital. But, like, like I remember them when they were eating beans, right? And, and, um, and it's just fun to see them do that well. Yeah. It's fun to see you do this well, right? I mean, it's like um, we had no reason to think the four-hour work week was going to be that big a deal. I mean— yeah. You hope it will. We had a lot of reasons like, to believe it wouldn't be a big deal. But I mean, I mean it was like, it, it's just like every time I see, you know, I'll get a call from somebody, like a reporter that says, hey, would you do a quote for this article about Tim and some major publication? I'm like, wow, he's just killing it. That's awesome. Right? And it's just Thanks. fun to see. It's a lot more fun to spend your energy on deriving joy from that and seeing your friends do well, especially friends who are like worthy of doing well and won't be changed by it. Like, that's a lot more fun than remembering who wasn't nice along the way, you know? Yeah, it's a drag. I've, I've been working on the grudge piece. I don't have many, but it's good to see you. Yeah, I mean, like the long. Arab Spring, or like when I would, I'd pick up Sloan on a play date, you know, my daughter Sloan, and, and the parents of the play date would say, is it true you invested in Twitter? I saw them on Oprah. <laughs> and then the Arab Spring happened. And I was like, wow, this company's yeah. kind of working. <laughs> like, we got a chance to do well on this one. <laughs> so, you, so you mentioned your daughter. I want to uh, bring up something that I've thought a lot about since you, so you mentioned it to me. And as context for folks, what I've really tried to do in the last at least five years is to l look at the lives of people I look up to in a holistic way before modeling them, all right? So what I mean by that is it's tempting to look at, say, the business success of person X and then replicate everything they do. But all you may see is one tiny piece of the puzzle, and then in actuality, they walk around in shambles in every other capacity. So I've, I've tried with the interviews and the books and tribe mentors to really look at things holistically. And I remember asking, and I ask, even though I don't have kids, I ask parenting advice of friends a lot because I'm curious to see how they look at it. And at one point, I asked you, we were on a hike, and I asked you what advice you would give to a new parent or someone thinking about 
becoming a parent, and please correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but I my bet re- your versions could be better. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to, to my recollection, there were two main points that you made, and, and there could be more, but you said, number one, really teach your kids and train them to be optimists, because without that, you're lost, and with that, you can at least look for or see solutions and silver lining and so forth. And then the second part was, remember that your kids owe you nothing. Like, they didn't ask to be born. You, you chose. You remember. Wow. I do remember. It was meaningful to me. I really made an imprint. And your job is to give them love. It is not their job to give you love. That's right. They, I chose to have them. They didn't choose to have me. Right. They owe me nothing. Yeah. And, uh, like, I find it helpful to think about that. But, but like, the, 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 the hope part, I think, is, is important for them. Like, the, the, the way I look at it is, unfortunately, unless we solve some breakthrough problem, we're all going to die. So you can choose to be defeatist about that, or you can choose to say the fact that we get to live at all is just this huge gift. Yeah. And so, like, I think that one of the things that you can do for your kids is you can help them feel optimistic and happy about the fact that they have the gift to be alive and that um, don't be defeatist about this world. You had the gift of today. And as long as you have the gift of today, like you should be, like you're, you're on the path to the light, right? And, um, uh, and if, you can, if you can give your kids the gift of being optimistic and hopeful about the future and grateful that they have the time they're gonna have, like I think that that's helpful for them. Because, like, kids get, ju- they get judged, and, you know, all of us are unkind to ourselves in our own mind, and we're judged by people all the time. And it's easy to just forget that just today's a gift. Be grateful for that gift. Be optimistic that tomorrow's going to be another day where you have another gift. So when your kids, or, say, one of your entrepreneurs, I mean, <laughs> startups are a full contact sport, right? I mean, yeah. people take their lumps in, in major ways, and bad things happen all the time. Uh, whether it's with your kids or some of the founders you've worked with, when they're going through a really rough time, what do you what do you say to them? Uh, and it, it, you could give a, re, a you know specific example or just a, a general principle, but I'd be curious to hear how you'd think about that. Um, well, so so like these founders that we've worked, some of them are just extraordinary, right? And so I. I uh, I'm reluctant to say we had much of an impact. Um, I think the thing that sometimes I've done uh, that I've been proud of is like when they're in the depths of despair, you know, like entrepreneurship's like this, where there's no, there's no even path. And uh, there are times where you just like, everything is against you and you're just like, how did I get myself into this? And this is so terrible. Uh, and, um, I think I've been better than most at those times at kind of saying, you've got this. How do you, how? And sometimes, sometimes they need to hear that. Is it just the words or how do you deliver it? Like what makes no, it No, I tell, I tell them, look, look, you know, Twitter, we couldn't keep the servers running. We couldn't decide who the CEO was. Uh, Twitch, it was Justin TV. We didn't even know what Twitch was. That story. Uh, Chegg was Craigslist for colleges and then... Facebook decided to compete with us, and we pivoted to textbook rentals, and we only had 30 days left of cash. And like NG Moco, we had 45 days of cash, and we pivoted from app downloads to free-to-play. And Lyft started out as Zimride, and when we launched Lyft, we weren't even sure it was legal. So I'm like, guys, <laughs> like guys, I've seen way crazier than this. You got this. And, and uh, sometimes a founder needs to know, look, Entrepreneurship, on so, I, like, I like to say I like to invest in people I would enjoy getting in trouble with because <laughs> it happens every time. And, and, um, <laughs> and like when you're in trouble with these people, what's it going to feel like? Is it going to feel like, okay, it's us against the world? Yeah. Or is it going to feel like, oh, how did I get myself involved with these people? <laughs> and so like I like people where I'm like, we're in the foxhole together. Screw the rest of the world and what they think. We're right. They're wrong. Let's rock and roll, right? And so, um, so that's kind of, uh, I think that we've been, like I like to say, when I was an entrepreneur, one of the things I learned is that my early customers, they didn't just buy what I was selling. They bought because they believed what I believed. 
we were in on a secret together. And like when I work with founders, I like to say I'm in on a secret with them. I believe their secret. And like we think the rest of the world's just wrong. We think we're right and we're going to prove it. And so when stuff goes wrong, we're like, eh, it's just a setback, speed bump, whatever. <laughs> but, but like in the end, it's like we still believe in our insight. We're right. Let's, let's prove it. Let's prove it. What about uh, for yourself, if, if you can think of, you know, in the last decades, could be anything, but when, when you, could you give us an example of maybe a tough time that you went through and how you found your way out of it or what helped you find mm. your way out of it? Could be any, any facet of life. Gosh, uh, there's a fair number. Um, you know, Liz, Liz and I broke up, uh, you know, we've been married for 17 years and things didn't work out and that just felt like um like like I'd really failed as a person and I was about to fail as a dad and you know like uh what else uh what else was there if I failed at those things then what could I even think I was successful at so that was a that was a tough time um but but um you know fortunately uh kiddos turned out okay and um you know, I tried the hardest I could to navigate that time the best I could, and, you know, kids turned out great, and Liz and I get along just fine, and, you know, you, you win some, you lose some, but, but at that point in time, it just felt like everything I had done in this life was screwed up, and I'd just totally blown it. How did you not just succumb to the depths of despair and stay there? Yeah, and someday, you know, we, we need to have some more wine to talk about this because I know you've said that you've, you've struggled, right, at I times have. with yeah. feeling depressed. And um, I'm like the worst person to talk to depressed people because I just don't understand the concept. Like, like, and it's like I'm not judging, <laughs> right, but like I'm, I'm just like um, uh, today's a gift. Yeah, yeah. And like I have to like make the most I can out of it, and if it doesn't work out... <laughs> Make the most out of tomorrow. And, and by the way, like, I don't look at that, like, I don't think that my way of thinking is better than your way of thinking. Like, it's sort of like you're leaner than I am. You could probably run faster, jump higher. I don't sit there and say, give me your legs, right? <laughs> I, I just realize that we're all different, and I realize that, that, like, I've had a few blessings in life, and one of them is to be grateful for every day. So, and, and, like, to, for that to be the high order bit, no matter what's happening, I'm like, you got to have today. So did that, was that just a life wrap that you had throughout that entire period that each morning you'd remind yourself of? Or how did it manifest on it's a just, daily basis? It's just, it's just ever present. It's just ever, pre it's just obvious to me. It's like breathing oxygen. And I need to borrow your code. All right. Yeah. But, I, but I don't say that as like, listen to me and my advice. I'm so smart. It's just, I was lucky enough to be configured and wired that way. So I want to make a suggestion to everyone in the audience. And this is based on observing Mike over and over again. When someone says to you, well, you can explain it to me. I'm just, I'm a, not a fast thinker. I'm from Texas. When someone pulls that, you should really be careful. <laughs> and uh, I actually borrowed that from you. And I was like, I think I can use this because most people think people from Long Island are idiots. Great. So I'll be like, you know, explain it to me again because I'm not clear. My brain doesn't move that fast. I'm from Long Island. And everyone's like, what? And then, <laughs> so thank you for Okay. Allowing me to, to, to steal I'm, I'm that. I'm glad I could help you act simple. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to bring up, uh, and this is actually something we have not spoken about uh, publicly or privately before, but Commander John Boyd. Yeah. Can you explain who Commander John Boyd is and why you're a fan? Yeah, so um, uh, Commander John Boyd was um, a flight instructor for the Air Force. And he, there was this expression that in a simulated dogfight, he could, he could beat any pilot in like 30 seconds or some outrageously quick amount of time. And people were like, well, how does he do that? And he taught, he taught this form of combat, which was about moving very quickly. And um, uh, so it's, if you place yourself in the time I was reading about John Boyd, it was also when I was working with Eric Reese and Steve Blank, and so Eric Reese was a consultant at Floodgate before he wrote The Lean Startup. He's famous just like, I, I have this magnetism for famous future-to-be authors, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, So we, we were talking, and we're like, something really important is happening here. 
offshore labor, search engine marketing, open source software, broadband penetration, global markets, and it seems like you can get a product to market for less money, you can do it faster. And uh, Steve Blank ta started talking about this guy named John Boyd. And so John Boyd was this flight instructor in the Air Force, and he could beat anybody in a dogfight super fast. And, and Boyd's fundamental insight was that sometimes you can win a battle purely by being faster. So like, let's say you're in a Russian MiG and I'm in an F-16, and I make the wrong move, but you haven't moved yet. And then I make the right move before you've moved yet. Just the mere fact that I was able to make a move in course correct before you made your counter move means two things. I can get in the right position relative to you, but more importantly, it's very disorienting to you because you don't know where I am. I was here, now I'm there. And so the, the philosophy of John Boyd that was inspiring to me back in 2005 and one of the reasons I started Floodgate was, I was like, you can do this as an entrepreneur and an investor. And so the F-16 fighter jet was designed to John Boyd's spec. An F-16 doesn't fly faster than a Russian MiG, but it changes directions faster. And so the F-16 fighter was a system. It wasn't just the plane, which could change direction faster. It was the mind of the pilot. And the mind of an agile pilot with an agile plane will beat a, mush beat a Russian MiG all day long. And so, um, so I was like, that's what's going to happen with startups. And that's why 500,000 is the new 5 million. And that's why we need to go fund these agile entrepreneurs because they're going to be able to force multiply. And the big competitors who've raised a bunch of money and are going slower and doing waterfall development, they're going to be disoriented by how fast these companies move. And so, like, what I, what, what I really learned from Boyd was kind of this idea that if you, if you are a speed-based competitor, uh, you can be wrong but still be right quicker, which makes you right. Right, which, which translates very directly to blank and Eric Reese and That's right. minimum viable product and yep. iterating. You could, yeah. you could be totally off base in the beginning, which a lot of your biggest hits have been. in the Right, 93% of our exit profits have come from pivots. And so, you know, you look at that and you say gosh, when we invest, should we even care what the business is? <laughs> I mean, it's a legitimate question. So, <laughs> so like cruise automation, right? That's one of our recent wins. Uh, you know, Kyle had started Twitch. We made a bunch of money on Twitch. And uh, he starts this company called Cruise. It's like a roof rack that does autopilot self-driving. I'm like, Kyle, that's a bad idea because you're going to have 20 customers in the world. There's only 20 car companies that matter. And they have concentrated buying power, and they can design you out unless you're, like, ten times better, and there's going to be competition, blah, blah, blah. So six months later, he's like, okay, you're right. The roof rack idea was dumb. I've got this new idea. I'm like, what's your new idea? He's like, I'm going to make L Nissan Leaf self-driving. And I'm like, then what are you going to do? He's like, well, you know, there's a lot of ways you can monetize that. You can do a fleet of cars. You can sell the cars to people. You do so I'm like, okay, let me get this straight, Kyle. Now you're just going to compete against everybody. You're going to compete against Uber and Lyft and Tesla and GM and everybody, Bosch. He's like, yeah, but, you know, I'm passionate about this. I've been doing this since MIT. It's my research project, and I just, I just think this is the way to go. And I sat there, and I thought about it. I was like, you know, this guy made me 84 times my money last time I wrote him a check. I think I'm just going to write him a check. <laughs> and so... so um, <laughs> So I, so I go to the partner meeting at Floodgate, and thank God you don't have, we don't have a voting system. And I say, um, I say, you know, I think I've decided I'm going to do this cruise deal. And everybody reads me the riot act. And they're like, Mike, come on. Like, I understand that a business model can be vague. But, like, you cannot even articulate a path where this is a business. <laughs> and uh, neither can Kyle. And I was like, no, but you don't understand. And the, he's an awesome founder. And he's got incredible insights. And he's very passionate, blah, blah, blah. So, I, I, like, everybody just, like, talk to the hand. This is stupid, whatever. <laughs> so we had two new uh, venture partners who became partners, Ryan and Arjun. And six months later, they get bought by GM for more than a billion dollars. And... Um, Ryan and Arjun go, boy, it's really a shame we talked you out of this cruise deal. And I said, oh, we funded cruise. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was like, of course we funded it. I'm I like, secretly have super like, voting rights like, on every deal. No, we, at Floodgate, there's no voting system. 
It's just somebody has to pound the table. And so if somebody pounds the table and says, I will take ownership of this and I am responsible for the outcome of our returns, the deal happens. But if everybody around the table is an A minus and says, I think this is a good deal for you to do, Tim, or you to do, Ann, or you to do, Ryan, or you to do, Arjun, but nobody says, I will pound the table, I'm irrationally in love with this, doesn't happen. Hmm. So like we, you know, we kind of think that in the super early stage, kind of love conquers all. And it's like, you know, when you're going through all these times, you're going to get in all this trouble, it's your love for the idea and the founder that will cause you to, like, overcome whatever you face. And you have to have enough authentic love and passion for the idea and the founders that you're willing to pound the table and say, I will defend this. I will defend 140 characters or less, even though people say it's stupid in 2007, <laughs> right? So it just need, you just need one person who is in some cases, irrationally exuberant and willing to defend the idea yeah. for, for a go signal. For sure. And then, uh, so this is, this is really fascinating to me. Uh, yeah, we're not exactly a private equity shop. No, but <laughs> it strikes me that some of the best investors I know have a, a similar or close cousin approach to that. Like if they have somebody who's willing to just put it all on the line, who's already been vetted because they were hired as a partner, it's like, okay, kid, like, it's on you then. Uh, but if they're really willing to go, yeah. go, to, go to fight for it. And, and by the way, like, if you're a partner of Floodgate, yeah, you pound the table. But guess what? We keep track of the deals you did. And if you, like, lose tens of millions of dollars with no returns, it's nothing personal. <laughs> but, like, you just don't seem to be cut out for this. You're not allowed right? to pound our table anymore. Right. So, <laughs> so, like, when I pound the table for a deal, I know just as much as any other partner that I am taking ownership of pounding the table. And we're going to all help each other, and we're not going to say, yeah, I told you so. But it's like, if I pound the table, I'm saying, I care enough about this idea that I'm willing to have some of my track record and credibility be tied to this. So how do you differentiate, if you look at, for instance, 93% of the returns coming from companies that pivoted? Yeah. When you are observing a founder or trying to help, and just by way of giving the most convoluted question possible. Okay. Question I get a lot is, how do I know when to persist with my idea? How do I know when to quit? Or how do I know when to pivot? That's a hard question to answer. Yeah. But when I spoke with Mark Andreessen a while back for the podcast, he said, you know, sometimes people pivot so often, it's like every time I see them, I'm paraphrasing here, it's like watching a rabbit go down a maze. It's like, they, yeah, no. it's like every two days, it's a different company. Yeah, it's like they think it's a mulligan, not a pivot. Right. Yeah. right. So how do you how do you help guide or even assess a, a, a good pivot versus someone who's merely unfocused? Yeah, so, um, uh, and, and, you know, it could be that I've just been, had a string of crazy beginner's luck. And so right. that is a very real potential factor. Yeah. Uh, but but um, uh, the way I see it is that uh, you are right when, when, not because people agree with you, you are right or wrong based on whether your first principle's thinking is right or wrong. And so if I see a company where it's not working, but I still believe in the first principles of the idea, I say, this is great. We still believe in the first principles, and we know more than we knew a year ago. That's a fundamental advantage. Like, why would we want, not want to double down on that? And so, uh, whereas what, what happens too often is you say, this doesn't work, it doesn't have traction, we're not going to be able to raise money, you know, forget about it. And the problem with that is that if you live with the results of other people's thinking, it's, it's like if, if somebody really smart, like if I, if, you know, I guess if, if Reed Hoffman says to me, this is a bad network effects idea because of, it doesn't conform to network theory in these ways, I'm like, okay. That's data. He's the smartest network effects guy I know. The best pr first principles thinker about network effects I know. And I offered a first principle to him that he said, you're wrong on first principles. I'm like, hmm, I probably ought to listen to that. <laughs> uh, but like if somebody, like with Chegg, right, when we did textbook rentals, people said, oh, people tried that before with varsity books. And like, who gives a shit? That was five years ago. Like, five years ago isn't today. And so, like, um, like to me, it's about, like, what are, what are just your first principles reasoning behind 
why you're excited about something and are your first principles reasons being refuted or doubled down on? Because to me, the valid definition of a pivot is the first principles are still true, but you learned something from the data on the ground that caused you to double down on a new aspect of that that nobody else knows. Got it. So you have... Yeah. Inst- but, but like yeah. that may just me be giving a good explanation for why I got lucky. That is perfectly reasonable <laughs> point of view for you to take. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, I would tend to assess it as certainly a component of skill. But if you're looking at then, let's just take, you have the first principles, maybe then you have strategy, then you have tactics, and you have tools. You could look at a stack. Uh, are the first principles in your investing experience mostly spotting, say, converging trends that people haven't spotted before? What, what would be an example of first principles as it applies yeah. to one of these companies? Well, will you surf? Do you surf? Poorly. Poorly. I surf even more poorly. Yeah. Uh, but, but like, I like the metaphor of surfing because you could be a skilled surfer, but you don't really control surfing, right? You can sort of control the board-ish. Even if you're good, you can only barely control it. But you can't control the wave. And like, I look at, the, to me, the magic that animates the tech industry is a combination of Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law. And so I think we all benefit from the magic of Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law. And it's like literally as powerful as the ocean waves below you when you surf. And so like, I look at it like the job of a startup founder is to surf a valid wave. And the wave is usually bigger than the company. Right, like when we invest in Lyft and Cruise, we had this belief that network capitalism is supplanting vertically integrated corporations and that there would be network transportation, just like I believe there's going to be network real estate, network manufacturing, all this stuff. And so we believe that those gathering waves are more powerful than any one company and that the, the, the job of the tech entrepreneur is to leverage the awesome, massive power of all of the, you know, all of the fury of the ocean beneath them, of Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law, just surf into the beach. And, you know, like, give Moore's Law enough time, it will breach the advantage of any incumbent. And give Metcalf's Law enough time, and it will create an insurmountable moat. Google tried to take out Twitter with Jaiku. Didn't work. Didn't matter, because Twitter had a network effect. And so, like, to me, like, the tech industry is magical. Like, there's been tulips in the past. There's been the crash of 29. There's been the real estate bubble. There's bubbles all the time. There's manias all the time. But tech is animated by two valid exponential forces that are super powerful. And they are the asymmetric attack vector of the entrepreneur. They are the, they are the rock in David's slingshot. And so uh, I look for founders who have some type of fundamental contrarian insight about where a wave's about to gather. And then hopefully they have the stuff to surf it. And if they do, I'm like, hey, let's rock, unconditional love, let's go. <laughs> well, you, you gave me some related advice really early on. I remember. Do you need any more, by the way? Any more wine? Good? Yeah. I think, I think I have a wine good. deficiency, good. yes. Yeah, I would love some wine. Here. I got you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You gave me some advice. I remember it was at a restaurant in Palo Alto, there was uh, an event gathering. Reed Hoffman was speaking, I was attending. Uh-huh. And yep. we were having wine, much like we're having right now. <laughs> and we were talking about some deal I was flummoxed by because I had certain primitive parameters for investing and I was getting somewhat ridiculed for my simplistic parameters. <laughs> like, I need to be a power user of the product. Mm-hmm. I need to, it needs to match with the demographic, the sort of core audience that I have. And I got a lot of flack for it. And I remember you said to me, well, if those are, say, you didn't use these words then, but like your first principles, those are your sort of criteria. If, if you fo- it, you're going to make, in some cases, really good investments when people are poo-pooing the idea, but it perfectly matches sort of your criteria. When it's, when based they're, on first principles. Right, based on first principles. Conversely, if it doesn't match your first principles and you're in, getting into a deal because it's closing tomorrow, but or we can feel you in, or whatever. Yeah. If you're just following some consensus, however small, but it doesn't conform to your first principles, that's where you're going to lose your money. Yeah, this is where, like, people talk about social proof. I think social proof is bullshit. <laughs> uh, I think that it's... Um, th- so my favorite example is actually an Elon Musk example. So I don't know if it, some of you may have heard this, but 
I thought you were going to say, I um, think some of you may have heard of him. <laughs> so, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair to assume. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so um, he talks about SpaceX, and most people think SpaceX is like a better NASA, but that's not true. So you think about a rocket, um, what, 0.3% of the cost of the rocket is the fuel, and the rest of it is what gets burned up in space, what doesn't come back. So Elon says, okay, if you could have a reusable rocket, you could, ha- you could maintain 99.7% of the value of the rocket by bringing it back to Earth. And if you could do that, you could have a two orders of magnitude improvement of the economics of space travel. That's first principles thinking. Or when Ev says, if 10 million people write microblogs, that's 10 times more. The burden of proof is on people who are negative. And so, like, I don't have to see the business plan to say that's an insight I can get behind right? Uh, Conversely, I'll see plenty of business plans that look incredibly straightforward, and I eliminate them immediately because they're just not exponential enough and they're not first principles enough. And my whole business isn't about how how often I lose. It's the magnitude of the rightness when I win. And so, like, when I win, I have to win super freaking big. This is such an important point because it applies to life and not just well, it depends. Like, if you're a PE guy, you don't want private to lose. Equity. You don't want more than private equity. You don't want to have more than like a 15% loss ratio. Sure. So you're you're you want to take out risk, and you want. But I'm not a risk taker outer. I'm a luck multiplier, right? Like, I'm not asking what can go wrong because I'm investing when it's worth zero. Right. I'm asking what could go spectacularly right as a rare event, and I only have to be right a fair number of times as long as the idea has the exponential awesome power to just take us to the promised land. Well, well, this is part of what appealed to me about the startup game as you explained it to me, because it's a hits-driven business. You can be wrong a lot, but if you have decent rules that have some basis in reality... Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Then as long as you're... This is, we don't have to get into like portfolio theory and stuff, but yeah. as long as you're investing enough in these bets that they can say return the fund or whatever the parameters might be, it's a, it's a fun game uh, and uh, certainly a dangerous one. But let me ask you this because I remember how impactful, and then we're going to go to audience Q&A okay. in, my, in my, my, my pink basket that I brought. Uh, if you were teaching, you can pick the age. It could be college freshman, college senior, high school senior, doesn't really matter, graduate school, if you were teaching a class on entrepreneurship, so you're not teaching people how to be investors? So we do now. We teach one at Stanford. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, that makes this easy. So yeah. what do you teach? What are, what are the sort of differentiators of the class? Um, what, we, what we try to do is help people understand that um, – there are things that we can learn from these prime mover entrepreneurs who create massive abundance, and it's about more than just having a good product. Product market fit, clearly important, but designing a company, what's your culture? Are you going to define it up front or just kind of let it happen? What's your category? Are you going to design your category, just let it happen? Um, Are you going to chase revenue or are you going to accumulate attractive customers? And so, like, what we try to, what we try to emphasize, we try to emphasize a couple things. One is, great businesses truly are valuable, and so we should try to think about building a scalable business with the truth of value in mind, rather than what's the latest fad, and how do we raise money, or what's a paper unicorn, or any of that stuff. But then the other thing that we, we worry about some is that you look at some of the, these companies and the problems they've had with their culture... And um, a lot of these people come from Stanford or the top schools, and it's like, it, how do we have some impact where if, if, if only one person who might have gone off the rails as a founder in that dimension doesn't? Because we're like, you know, culture matters, uh, building a company foundation matters, how people treat each other matters. And some of this stuff is like a blockchain transaction. You get it wrong, you can't go backwards. Or like the metaphor I like to use, like the Hertz 
rental car parking lot. If you back up, the tires explode. And so you can't, <laughs> some of this stuff, you can't really back up. And so getting it right the first time, there's a lot of counterintuitive lessons. And it's more about just having a good product. It's about designing a company and a category in addition to the product. And, you know, having a point of view about how you're going to bring abundance to the world and not just get rich. And so um, the class is sort of about that and about just like, oh, the other idea is that, like, you don't, if you're a prime mover, you don't just have to be a tech entrepreneur. Like, you could be uh, uh, the French laundry guy, Keller, uh, Thomas, Thomas Keller. Keller. You can be uh, Elvis Presley and you invent rock and roll. Or you can be Albert Einstein, you could have a theory, or, um, you know, MLK had a dream. But it's sort of, the idea that we try to express to people is find your gift and express it your way. And um, entrepreneurship is only one way to express that gift. But if they learn anything from the class, it's not be an entrepreneur like these people. If entrepreneurship happens to be your calling, great. Here's what great people do. But figure out your calling. Figure out your gift. You don't have much time. Don't live someone else's life. Don't live by somebody else's thinking live your gift and actualize it to the fullest. How do people who say hear that, and I'm sure you go into much uh, more detail in the class. Yeah, there's 13 no, lectures. No, no, so. yeah, 13 lectures, but yeah. for those people listening, if they wanted a place to start just to get a toehold and they say, God, I want to do that, I just don't know what my gift is, what would you say to them? Like, what are the sort of whispers through the ether they should pay attention to or any indicators? I'd, I'd say spend time with awesome people and uh, work on things with them, and uh, you'll find it. But most people, most people fail to find their gift not because they can't find it. It's because they're too busy worrying about what other people think. And, like, one of the things that I find... Uh, so, like, one of the things I find inspiring is that... Um, I, I wrote this post one time, and I was surprised that... So uh, I called it Finding Billion Dollar Secrets. And the point that I was trying to make was that billion dollar secrets are everywhere. It's just that people aren't looking to pick them up off the ground. They're looking at each other. They're looking at status. They're looking at, hey, when I was in high school, I got rewarded for giving the teacher the answer to the questions the way they wanted it. And then I went to the right college and got the right graduate degree and got the right job at the right company and lived in the right neighborhood, and had the right designer kids, sent them to the right designer schools, and was in the right country clubs, driving my right designer car. And they get, they get focused on, you know, Peter Thiel would probably call this mimetic behavior, right? This, this idea of people's desires being defined by the people around them, and what's going to make a good impression on the people around them. The best entrepreneurs I know, they're just like, screw all that. I know why I'm here in this world. That secret on the ground, that's my gift. I'm picking it up. I'm doing this. And, and like that to me, that's the thing I'd tell my 20-year-old self, my 15-year-old self, my kids, is like figure out your gift, your gift. It's not, it's not the world's opinion of your gift. It is yours. It belongs to you. And figure out the gift that belongs to you and express your gratitude for the time you have by offering that gift. I love it. Ah, you guys can see why I've bugged Mike so much over the years with questions. Speaking of questions, I think, oh boy. can I add one more? Sure. Oh boy. Wow, this must be, this is like the Willy Wonka golden ticket of questions. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, wow, look at this. Oh, look at that, rogue question wow. givers. All right. <laughs> I hope a lot of these questions I had no are idea what was happening. I'm, I'm going to learn a lot more from your answers, I think. I yeah, know, this is like the improv jazz of, of question receiving. All right. So I'll, I'll, start with the, uh, I'll start with the first one, uh, and then we'll just kind of bounce between these. So the, <laughs> oh, God, a two-part question always, which, by the way, means two questions. Uh, where would you have moved besides Austin? Uh, there are a few places I looked. I looked at, I love Austin. I've wanted to move there since I graduated from school. I just didn't get the job at Trilogy Software. Funny story. Founder of Trilogy, 
was my roommate in college. <laughs> so yeah. I could have helped you out. <laughs> I know. I could have hooked you up. I didn't know what to do. I was, yeah. I was, I was, uh, I was lost, a babe in the woods. Uh, so I, Boulder, Colorado, I'm a huge fan of Boulder. Uh, I also looked at uh, BC. I really like British Columbia and uh, areas up in Canada. Uh, sorry, Americans. Thank you. Uh, Whoa. And uh, there were many different places that I considered, but Austin has this gravitational pull for me, so I ended up uh, there. What changed my mind on the significance of fiction versus nonfiction? Really, it was because I had onset insomnia, and I did not want to turn on my problem-solving apparatus by reading business books and so on before bed. And I found that fantasy, Dune, Ender's Game, Stranger in a Strange Land, uh, The Name of the Wind... Read that, but be prepared to wait like 17 years for the last in the trilogy. Have you ever read The Crown, Count of Monte Cristo? You know, I haven't. Oh, my gosh. Speaking of a book about grudges. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> what, so since we're on books, what, what books do you most recommend or gift to other people? Hmm. Gosh. Uh, lately, I've liked, um, there's, a, there's a woman named Bronnie Ware called, she wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And she was a hospice nurse who would spend time with people in the last 90 days of their life. And um, she, would, she would learn, like, what their regrets were. Or sometimes she'd learn what their happiness was. So um, there was an example of this woman who was from a super rich family. And uh, she decided to marry an artist. And the family excommunicated her. And she's, like, 32 years old. She gets cancer and she dies. And she hasn't heard from her family in years. And uh, her mom comes to her at the end and says, uh, you know, to be honest, I was just jealous. You were living life on your own terms. And I've got all these obligations. I don't even like my life that much. And I was just kind of pissed off that you could go marry some artist and be this happy. And I realized, like, how wrong I was. But this woman who's dying says, I have no regrets. I got to be with the person I wanted to be with. And, like... I would have loved to have lived longer, but nobody knows how much time they're going to have. And at least I got to have the time that I got the way I wanted to have it, the best I knew how. And, and then they would have another person who the opposite was true. They would be dying and they'd say, promise me, Bronnie, that you will not live life according to other people's thinking. Because I lived my whole life trying to please other people. And I, if I could have it over again, I wouldn't do that. And so she, she does a great job of like having... The example of the person who did it well with no regrets and the person who's like, fuck, right? I'm dead now and like I could do it over again. I'd do it different. And so, so um, and, and it's, it's motivating to say, gosh, you know, how am I measuring up against those five things? And so, so I like that book because it kind of takes people out of the here and now and kind of at, it forces you to confront a broader set of issues. Yeah, I think that um, for me in the last few years, I've had a lot of death. Uh, friends pass away in the last two years or so, and um, including Terry Lachlan, rest in peace, who's in this book, and uh, just a few weeks ago. And I found it really, in an odd way, reaffirming to familiarize myself with death and grief and grieving uh, in, in, in almost a preemptive way. I mean, one of my favorite people, I'm sure you've spent time with him, Matt Mullenweg, incredible entrepreneur, but first and foremost, just a beautiful human being. And he lost his father uh, in a very unexpected way, and he recommended on grief and grieving to me. And yeah. uh, I, think it's, I think it's a very and useful exercise to familiarize yourself with the details of death and people passing. And I learned a lot of this from Julie, who's my love of my life and puts up with me. And, uh, you know, she's helped all these people who've had cancer. And so as a result, she ends up seeing a lot of people pass. And, you know, I think more than anybody, she taught me that in the last, um, in the last bit of time you have, all the shit falls away, right? All the expectations, all the external stuff and so you just hope that when that when that time comes you're like I did the best I could you know did it the way I could and so um that's uh that's why I find that that book helpful it's not because I'm preoccupied with dying I hope I live a long time but it's like when the time comes I want to say I did it my way I did the best I could I honored the gift
So that's a good book. And there's business books too, but we'll, we'll do that some other I th- time. I think that's yeah. a good place. Yeah. <laughs> good place to, to move. All right, is everybody cool? Well, if you have to leave, you have to leave. Are people cool with going a little longer? I'm having fun. I hope you guys. All right. So here we go. Uh, this is a left turn from what we were talking about. But I'm curious okay. to hear your answer. What emerging technologies or theoretical technology that could really go wide uh, do you believe are most promising for anti-authoritarian disruption? Similar to how, That's a leading question. Similar to how Bitcoin disrupts government control of money, Maybe. Uh, I'm very interested in, in crypto and blockchain. You mentioned okay. blockchain earlier, so I'm going to... too bad we don't have Naval here. Yeah, oh, yeah, That'd be I know, awesome. I know. Yeah. But I would be curious to, to hear first your thoughts, just general thoughts on crypto and blockchain, and then any other emerging technologies that you think are promising for anti-authoritarian disruption. Okay. So um, uh, I hope this isn't a shaggy dog answer, uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't um, even know what that is. But shaggy it dog good. story is oh. like a really long story oh, uh, that never yeah. ends. But um, <laughs> so, so for better or worse, I'm a little bit of a history buff when it comes to business. And so I took this class when I was in business school, and only Harvard Business School would have a class called "The Coming of Managerial Capitalism." <laughs> and uh, but it was a fascinating class because... Sexy name, rolls off so the like, tongue. Like, for example, like in the year 1820, there weren't any companies in America with more than 100 employees. You know, because you had people trading, selling muskets or fur, or like if you were a really big monster company, you were like a spinning loom in Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, and, and spinning yarn and fabric. Well, then the railroad and the steam engine come out, and that changes everything. So, like, what people don't realize about people like John Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie, like, imagine you're doing Standard Oil, and you want to compete with a guy in Pennsylvania on oil prices. You don't just whip out your cell phone and call the branch manager and say, hey, lower the prices, run this guy out of business. I mean, there's no accounting. There's no org charts. There's no salaried managers. We don't even have the telegraph yet. We don't have shit, right? <laughs> and like Rockefeller is building a company against that backdrop. And then, you know, J.P. Morgan's like, well, there's nobody who has enough money to own a transcontinental railroad, so maybe I should do this thing where you create these fractional units of ownership of a company. We'll call it stock. You're, you're some guy who sells, you're a blacksmith in 1820, and somebody says, do you want to buy stock in a railroad? You're like, what good does that do me? Stock in some random company doesn't exist. Why would I want that? And so, like, but what happened was the modern corporation emerged and it drove the standard of living of humanity 13 fold from the year 1820 to 2000. The richest man in America in 1870 was Cornelius Vanderbilt. He didn't have flushing toilets, he didn't have running water, he didn't have electricity. You can have all those three things now and be defined as poor. And so I look at it and I'm like, people say capitalism is screwed up. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm like, it's a freaking miracle. It's like, in 1800, you had to work one hour to get six minutes of reading light. Today, you work one hour, you get 300 days of reading light. It's a miracle. And, And, you know... There's a lot of stuff that is wrong with how people are practicing capitalism, but free trade and voluntary, you know, I have this to offer, you have that to offer, we get to trade without somebody interfering, that's not the problem. That's not the problem we have. Well, what I think is happening today, and this is where blockchain gets in. I'm hearing a little Texas. Sorry for this shade. No, no, no. Uh, I believe that that blockchain and things like it and, and uh, Moore's Law and Metcalf's Law are the fundamental animating forces of what I like to call networked capitalism. And I believe that someday value is going to be created not by creating a large company where you have a lot of employees who work for you uh, and produce a lot of stuff, but instead it's going to be the people who create and curate software-defined networks. And um, I think that Tesla is a software network-defined car company. I think that Apple was a software network-defined phone company. Nokia thought they sell widgets. Apple thought, no, we sell, sell software-defined phone. The bet between Tesla and GM 
has nothing to do with who's selling more cars. It's that will Tesla figure out manufacturing faster than GM figures out how to be a software-defined network capitalist company, right? So, so like, okay, now back to blockchain. Uh, there's, a, there's a book I like a lot called The Wealth of Networks by Yohai Benkler. I read it about 10 years ago, and it influenced my investing a lot. And um, one of the things that, that Benkler talked about was we're going to move from the tragedy of the commons to the wealth of the commons. And the examples he used back then, he had dig in the book, actually. And he had examples of user-generated content and open-source software. Well, what if, just like the stock market was a new way to practice capitalism for the modern corporation animated by the railroad and steam engine that is a new way to create abundance? Because you couldn't have had a national railroad unless you had a stock market. You couldn't have said, hey, who has enough money to build a railroad? There was no one person who did. And so now I believe that crypto has the opportunity to create the wealth of the commons. And um, rather than a centrally organized equity capital structure, you have a set of people who contribute to a project on their own volition. And if the, the other people, their peers in the community, judge their value as compelling, they get rewarded. So it's, it's kind of like the wealth of the commons but, like, I find it easier to think about crypto not through the lens of, oh, so are you going to invest in a crypto company? How many shares are you going to own? That's wrong. That's like asking how many dollars are, am I going to own in the Transcontinental Railroad? No. Stock units are a new thing. Yeah, it's a different unit. Crypto tokens are a new thing. They are a new way to create wealth. They are a new way to w leverage the wealth of networks rather than vertically integrated, top-down owned companies. And so, like, I just believe that 100 years from now, uh, tokens or something like them will be one of many ways that a enterprising capitalist can create abundance in the world. And the more ways we can create abundance, the better. Does that obliterate venture, cap venture capital as we know it? Or does it just no. reconfigure no. it so that you guys are investing in the pickaxes? Yeah, so, like, I don't really... It's funny, so, like, I'm friends with Vinny Lingham, who did Civic, and the first time we met, he's like, hey... ICOs make you irrelevant, but I'm happy to give you <laughs> courtesy of my time. And I'm like, Vinny, like, look, I'm just not afraid of what's going to be done to me. The question I asked today is, what would J.P. Morgan do if he's alive? J.P. Morgan wouldn't be like, oh, how am I going to get disrupted? Oh, gee. He'd be like, how can I play offense with crypto? And how can I create new businesses rather than, you know, like Elvis didn't say, I'm going to disrupt jazz. Right? He wanted to create rock and roll. And like when I look about crypto, I'm like, what would Elvis think? What would JP Morgan think? I think disruption in tech startups is kind of bullshit. None of, the, none of the tech startups I've invested in had people who said, you know, Logan and John didn't say death to taxis. Right? They were like, ride sharing is going to be awesome. It's going to bring people together and make things better. And um, disruption happens after you win almost by accident. Yeah. And it doesn't happen because you try to defeat taxis. It happens because you transcend taxis. And, and like, so, like, whenever people say, I'm going to disrupt something, I'm like, well, you're not a real entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurship comes from love and creation, not from anger and disruption and what am I going to attack. And so, like, I don't, like, I'm not going to get disrupted by crypto yeah. any more than the next guy will. So, just Jamie the Dimon might. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'd be happy to debate him anytime and anywhere. About Ooh, him. like this. It's a rumble in the jungle with Jamie Dimon. I can't yeah. wait for this to happen. So just so nobody gets fired, I did get the uh, wrap-up smiley face sign, okay. but I'm going to okay. temporarily ignore that. I apologize. Just so that everybody knows someone has done their duty, and I'm going to continue for a few more questions, and then we'll wrap up. I appreciate uh, everyone okay with that? Cool. Yeah. All right. So I'm having fun with my bud, Mike. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, all of these questions. I wonder if this is the same person. What nascent tech could most disempower the state? Where do you see tech potential for removing government yeah. control over the individual? <laughs> Holy shit, we got a bunch so, of so tech-enabled anarchists this in here. This is one of the reasons I like the wealth of networks is that <laughs> the wealth of networks potentially creates the opening to reestablish the idea of trade as a voluntary activity between people. And the government's role is not to own everything or legislate everything or give everybody handouts or free Scooby snacks. It's to, 
It is to protect the rights of people. That's why I believe a valid role of government is to protect the rights of people. Yeah. And what we've allowed our government to do is to have unsound practices with how they create, how they treat money, right? So the Fed is jacking with the money supply. And it's hurting honest people. By, if we want to explore that, we can. But like the Fed jacking with the money supply is picking the pockets of the middle class. And it isn't right. And, um, and, and like crypto has the, the opportunity to say money should have a price just like everything else. And we, just like we need to separate politics and religion, we need to separate politics and economics. <laughs> oh my God, we'd go down so many rabbit holes. Yeah, I know. It's no, no, it's bad. great. I know. It's great. Uh, <laughs> man, I can't wait for this rumble in the jungle, Jimmy Diamond. It's going to be great. I want front row tickets. All right. Uh, what were the traits you had early on that made you successful? I'll just leave it at that. That's from Jignesh. I'll leave the last name out just so I don't have to get permission for keeping you in the podcast. Um, I just think that uh, I was lucky that um, I was born with parents who were just really good to me and inspired me in ways that were surprising that I didn't understand at the time. Like when I was uh, when I when I was in the third grade, my dad bought me this book called How It Works Illustrated for my birthday. It was all these diagrams of how product, you know, how does a dishwasher work? How does a I know this book. It's a great book. It's a great it's awesome. book. And he writes in the front, he's like, um, I know this is a little bit advanced for a third grader, but, uh, you know, it'll make you think differently about life. And, uh, you know, someday you're going to invent things that are going to be in a book like this. What else? It's like, who has parents like that? Like, I didn't decide that. Yeah. Just like, just like uh, you, you're, you, you know, it, when your parent, your kids owe you nothing, it doesn't mean you can't be grateful when you get lucky and have good ones. Yeah. You're here. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. Uh, you know, I, I also, I think in a lot of ways, won the parent lottery. I wish I could give a better answer, but the one thing my parents did, there, there are a few things my parents did that I think were very helpful in retrospect. Now, it's all kind of post hoc analysis, right? So who knows? But I would say, number one, uh, you know, I wasn't, it's not like we, we did have a flushing toilet and electricity, so it's not like my parents were yeah, you're poor, but we didn't have, Cornelius Vanderbilt. yeah, but we didn't have, we didn't have uh, a lot of extra cash floating around, uh, parents never made more than 50 grand or so a year combined, and um, anyway, the, the, the point was two things, number one is they said, like, no, you can't have the new bike, can't do it, can't do this, but they said, and this is, I, I mean, maybe it was by necessity, not by engineering, but they said, the one thing we have budget for is books. So if you really want a book, like we'll figure it out. And so we used to go to the remainder table in this bookstore in our local hometown and pick books. And I remember to this day, some of those books, just like you do, Fishes of the World was when I wanted to be, become a marine biologist for 10 plus years because of this book. And uh, bought it for whatever, 70% off. And I carried it with me to school every day because this, the playground for me, I was a runt. I was a really small kid, born premature, got the shit kicked out of me like weekly until sixth grade. So I would stay close to the teacher yeah. <laughs> with this book. And I remember, I don't know, I've never talked about this, but I remember this one teacher, substitute teacher, not my real teachers because they knew me, but the substitute teacher said to my mom, you know, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't let him bring that book to school. He's going to destroy it. And my mom was like, what, the, what are you talking about? Like, he's not going to destroy that book. Like, it's the most important book he has. And uh, they were very good at uh, training us to want books. So that was a key. And then the second was, uh, my parents and uh, my mom in particular were really good at just exposing me to a lot of stuff. Yep. And it was free stuff. It was like, all right, we're going to take a trip to the aquarium when it's free. Totally. We're going to go to the beach and we're going to collect black sand with a magnet. And I'll try to explain what yep. magnetism is. And my mom threw so much against the wall and every once in a while something would stick and then she would just put everything behind it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like I read some book and I said, well, the best example of this dinosaur bones is in the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And my mom would say, well, we live in Princeton, New Jersey at the time and uh, there's a Museum of Natural History in New York. I'm like, but that's not where the biggest one is. 
And that's where, <laughs> like, sure enough, we'd be going to Washington, D.C. to see the biggest, di and like, Carolyn Maples, like, had, like, if I was interested in dinosaurs and that's where I wanted to see the biggest dinosaur, like, by golly, we were going to the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., and maybe while we're at it, we'll go to Gettysburg and learn something about the Civil War. But it was, uh, oh, one other thing that I think is good, and then on to the next thing, but um, my dad also told me, don't have heroes. And um, I think what he meant by that was that hero worship is a form of not thinking for yourself. Because heroes, first of all, a lot of times they're kind of a story and you don't really know what they're really like and what really happened and why they decided what they did. But the other thing is defining yourself relative to somebody else's accomplishment or how somebody else acts causes you to not spend the time to discover how you can be your best self. And so, like, it's okay to respect the way somebody thinks, or it's okay to respect a talent that somebody has that you could learn from, but that's different from saying, oh my gosh, Bill Gates is awesome, I want to be like Bill Gates. Because Bill Gates is awesome, right? He's awesome at being Bill Gates, <laughs> but you need to be awesome at being you. Yeah. And, like, having a hero can cause you to drift away from that. So my dad was always very, whenever somebody famous on TV, you know, Ronald Reagan was president when I was young, he'd be like, be very careful not to have heroes. You don't know their whole story. He's like, he may be a great person, but don't have, it, don't have that person as a hero. Figure out what you admire that they do hmm. and try to understand that, but don't, don't say, I want to be like that person ever. That's a good guideline. Yeah, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's really I don't know how I figured that out. <laughs> uh, this is a question from Anonymous. Very nice handwriting. Um, what would you put on a billboard? Could be, I don't know if you answered it in the book. So I did. Could, yeah. You did. So let's, let's hear. It could be that or it could be something else. But how would you answer that? What would you put on a billboard that got out to millions or billions of people? Uh, like, um, there's two things. One would be integrity is the only path where you'll never get lost. And that's the one that, that I put in your book. And then the other one would be think for yourself always. And um, thinking for yourself doesn't mean don't listen. But it means be willing to have first principles. And you are right or wrong not because of how powerful the person is who challenges you. You are right or wrong based on whether the content of your ideas and first principles is right or wrong. And you should, you should seek out people who challenge your first principles like goal because they'll make you better. But you should, you know, and that's like ego is about who's right and truth is about what's right. And if you become an authentic truth seeker in life, uh, to me that's kind of what it means to like think for yourself for you. I'm not, it's yours. I'm not going to follow that up. Yo, come on. You got is, it. No, everybody wants to know your sign. You I know, it. but I'm like the broken record player that says the same thing over and over again. All right. So I would say uh, I'm going to give a new answer. Actually, I'll give two. So the first would be, and this is advice I got really early on that has stuck with me for decades now. You're the average of the five people you associate with most. And Drew of Dropbox, many other people would give similar advice. And I think it's just so important, emotionally, financially, psychologically. It's very important yep. that you choose the people you spend time with. It doesn't have to be in person. It can be via podcast. It can be via yep. books. They don't have to be alive. It could be Ben Franklin. Yep. I've learned so much from Richard Feynman and Ben Franklin, for instance, as just two examples. Uh, it, and, and can I just double down on that? Because, like, and it doesn't even have to be five people that will help you succeed in your career. It's like, like Julie, right, who I was talking about earlier, uh, one, of, one of the companies that we invested in, the founder's son was 10 years old, got a brain tumor. And so he has to be operated on in San Francisco. And uh, Julie calls me and says, when are you going to get here? Like a few days later. I'm like, uh, sorry, am I supposed to, I'm in this meeting. I'm like, where are you? She's like, I'm here at the hospital. Uh, Hugo's about to be operated on. Where are you? And I realized, like, she never said, hey, let's meet at the hospital. But, like, what I realized from her was that she's like, what else are you doing that's more important than being here right now? 
Like, why did I have to tell you that? And she wasn't being judgmental about it. It was just, to her, it was just obvious. And so, like, part of it is not just five awesome business people uh, or five Fortune 500 whatever. It's, to me, it's more like five people who, in their own way, make you appreciate the gift of life in a more deep way so that you practice it better. And, like, where you say, wow that person changed my point of view about how to use my time. How to use your life. Yeah. yeah it's, we're going to wrap up in a minute, folks. Uh, I said I would give something new. I've given the, you're the average of the five people you associate with most a lot. So I'll give you yeah, another one. Sorry, one. I keep interrupting you. Uh, which is relatively recent discovery for me, which is... If you want to succeed in any holistic capacity, if you want to love the people you care for fully and have them feel that, you cannot do it if you merely tolerate yourself. You cannot do it if on some level you loathe yourself or aspects of yourself. And I spent, I mean, I've spent decades of my life like barely at best tolerating myself. I had some bad things happen to me and I, as a consequence, decided to just hone myself into an instrument of competition. That was it. And I found validation and uh, purpose in that, in being number one. And the, any joy I felt was really from observing other people experiencing joy. It wasn't intrinsic to me. And uh, forgiving yourself or loving yourself is not a nice to have. It is a must-have, even if you're doing it just for other people and the people you want to express your love to most fully. You, you need to solve that. And there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. That's the good news. So I would just say, whether it's a book like Tara Brock's Radical Acceptance, terrible title, great book, uh, or... Kamal's other, book, love, love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. Yeah, Kamal yeah. Ravikant's book, also exceptional. Uh, that is, I think, the root cause of so many things that we can perceive is 30 or 40 or 50 different problems to solve. And in fact, there are just one or two things that happen to you that you need to unpack yep. and contend with. Can you double click on that for a second? Because I don't, like, I think it's it, like people will sometimes say, hey, you should love yourself and they will dumb down that, th they won't understand the subtlety like yeah. of what you just said. And I think that's important. Yeah, so the, the, the subtlety, if we were to drill down I would say that, uh, and this is borrowing from someone, actually it's in the conclusion of Tribe of Mentors because it's that important to me. Um, Jim Lohr, or Lair, who's a performance coach, has worked with a lot of incredible athletes, and he, L-O-E-H-R, fascinating guy. And his book, uh, Mental Toughness Training for Sports, uh, there we go, uh, more? really changed my life. <laughs> sure. You're good? I got in, you. In high school, don't worry. I know, I'm getting the, I'm getting the stink guy. Uh, I'll make it up to everybody. Uh, Tell the whole story, Tim. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, Jim expressed to me when I met with him to learn how to play tennis for the first time, just in the last year, which I'd always wanted to do my whole life. He said, uh, in effect, you know, the most important voice we ever hear in our lives is the voice that no one else hears. It's the voice in our own heads. And for my entire life, or I mean really my entire life, it's been the most merciless, brutal coach you would never wish on your worst yeah. ever. Yeah, like raise your hand if you said something to yourself negative in your own mind today. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, yeah. And you can create, even if externally you have all of the material trappings or rewards of a financially successful career, if you have the nuclear family that everyone has dreamed of and painted in Norman Rockwell paintings, if that inner voice is just a demon on your back, you will not find the peace that you want. And nothing you buy, nothing you achieve will provide that. There are just things you need to unpack so that that voice becomes a different voice. It, it, is it fair, Tim, to say that part of love is... Uh... Like, you can love your country without thinking it's perfect. 
And you yeah. can love your kids without thinking it, they're perfect. Yeah. And part of like loving yourself is like saying, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm not going to be jingoistic about myself. Right. It's more about I'm going to hold myself in higher enough regard that I'm going to do the best I can with the day that I have. And I'm going to forgive myself when I screw up honestly. Yeah, um, that, that's a big yeah. part of it. And also yeah. for people who are looking for maybe a tactical recommendation, one thing I found very helpful, and I, I don't want to take too much time to go into it, but something called Meta, M-E-T-T-A, meditation, or loving kindness meditation. Uh, I went through a meditation retreat recently, which was very difficult for me, and I was practicing this. Just Google it. You'll find plenty uh, to convey in my meditation love and wishes for happiness to many different people who had helped me throughout my life. And I remember one of the teachers at this retreat said, at the very end, I was about to walk out the door, and she said, wait a second, have you done any loving kindness to earlier versions of yourself who experienced a lot of pain, who maybe felt unsafe? And I was like, didn't even occur to me to do that. Yeah. I would encourage everybody here to explore yeah. that. And I know we're, we're running out of time. So, Mike, I have one more question, and then I'll have some closing thoughts. This is the tradition at oh Inform to oh ask, what is your 60-second idea to change the world? No um, pressure. Okay. Think for yourself and be kind to yourself in your own mind. Because 90% of the unkindness that happens in the world is actually people being unkind to themselves. And if you're going to be, if you set out to make the world better, being kind to yourself in your own mind is probably the most straightforward, high return use of your time possible. Cheers to that. And so, uh, Mike, I just want to say that it's been such a joy and a privilege to know you for as long as I have. And uh, I really hope to spend more time with you. I mean, we've spent a lot of time together, but I'd like to spend more time. And I, I, I really, truly believe, and part of the reason I wanted to bring you out on stage tonight, that you're one of the most genuine, unentitled, positive people who want to also impart the gift of positivity to the world I've ever met. So I just want to thank you for that. All right. Well, it's been fun to see you do so well. <laughs> well, you too, man. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Mike Maples, yeah. Tim Ferriss. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, All right, bud. Thanks. Hey, guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the, uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by WordPress.com. I love WordPress. I have used it for so many years. It's my go-to platform for blogging and creating websites. I use WordPress.com for everything, every day. My site, Tim.blog, is built on it. The websites for my books, including Tools of Titans, Tribe of Mentors, it's all on WordPress.com. And the founder, Matt Mullenweg, one of my close friends, has appeared on this show many times. Just search Matt Mullenweg Tequila Ferris for quite an exciting time. Whether you're looking to create a personal blog, a business site, or both, you can make a really big impact right out of the box when you build on WordPress.com. And you'll be in good company. It's used by The New Yorker, Jay-Z, Beyonce, 538, TechCrunch, TED, CNN, and Time, just to name a handful. And one of my friends at Google, she'll remain nameless, has told me that 
WordPress.com offers the, quote, best out-of-the-box SEO imaginable, unquote. And it's one of the many reasons that nearly 30% of the internet is run on WordPress. You do not need experience or to hire someone. That's perhaps the best part. WordPress.com guides you through the entire experience. They have hundreds of designs and templates that you can use. And it's easy to get started. There's no need to worry about security, upgrades, hosting, any of that. They offer 24-7 support, and they're very, very responsive. If you have questions, they get right back to you. And this allows you to create the highest quality with the least amount of headache and friction. So if you're building a website, period, when my friends come to me and ask what I use, what I recommend they use, the answer is WordPress.com. So check it out. If you want to get started today, learn more with a 15% discount off any new plan. Go to WordPress.com forward slash Tim to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. So learn more. Take a look. WordPress.com forward slash Tim for 15% off a brand new website. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by ConvertKit, my go-to email service provider. I use them for everything. If you've ever wondered how professional bloggers, podcasters, YouTubers, and so on can build a platform they control and get the word out about their best content, email is still the answer. People think it's all social, 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 but one algorithm change and oops, bait and switch, now you only reach 10% of your audience. That is why I've doubled and tripled down on email. After reviewing many different email service providers, I ended up selecting ConvertKit for email like Five Below Friday, which goes out to about a million people now, because ConvertKit delivers on what matters most, to me at least. Easy to use systems, split testing and resending technology, both very, very important, high rates of deliverability and great hands-on customer service. So whether you run a business or simply have, say, a serious blog, ConvertKit has integrations with more than 70 different services, just about anything you might need, including hosting sites like WordPress, e-commerce platforms like Shopify, lead capture technology like Bounce Exchange or Sumo, and many more. They also offer a visual automation builder that makes it really easy to deliver the right content to the right people in your audience, just when they want it, if you want to segment in different ways, which a lot of people do. ConvertKit offers plans that adjust to the size of your business, so it's a good option whether you have 1,000 people or 1 million on your list, and certainly I am planning on growing and growing and growing, and I don't like switching email service providers, so I thought very carefully about this before I selected them. So check it out. Take a look at convertkit.com forward slash Tim. That's convert, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-K-I-T dot com forward slash Tim. And you can get your first month for free to kick the tires, test it out. That way, you can give it a shot, make sure that it works for you, your business, and all of that goodness. If you're like me, I hope you'll find that they get the job done. That's certainly been my experience. So check it out. Again, that's convertkit.com forward slash Tim for a free month of email services.